Okay, friends, thanks uh, for coming to the second day of the India Policy Forum. Uh, the first announcement is that I am not Ramesh Chand, who <laughs> unfortunately could not make it at the last minute. So I'm Dilip Mukherjee, uh, and I'll be chairing the session. The speaker, Sean Cole, will speak for half an hour. Yeah, no, no, no. My presentation was up here. Here it is. Excellent. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Sean Cole. I'm on the faculty uh, at HBS. And this is joint work with Garima Sharma, who will be a PhD student at MIT. And it's a real pleasure to be here at this forum. I was looking at my CV this morning, and my first published paper was actually in the first issue of the India Policy Forum uh, way back in, I think, 2004. Uh, and uh, so, so it's, it's a real pleasure to return here. So I'm going to breeze very rapidly through the motivation in the sense that I think we all understand that improving agricultural productivity is a desirable goal in India, at least if it can be done uh, at a low cost. Uh, and there's a widely held view that farming practices are suboptimal. There's been a lot of attention on overuse of fertilizer that farmers might actually be a, earn more profit and preserve the health of the soil by using less uh, urea. But there are also other opportunities such as uh, fighting global warming by reducing crop burning, uh, you know, adapting to new seed, seed varieties, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's one motivation. A second motivation of this paper, I think, is to give an example of a very simple uh, A-B test that a government could carry out at very low cost and very fast. So I think uh, there was some complaint about rigorous research taking a lot of time. But uh, this paper, at least, uh, the field work began on June 21st, and the draft was submitted on July 2nd. So that's an example of a very very fast, uh, rapid uh, turnaround. Now, that will come at two, uh, two costs. One is we made a mistake in the experimental design that we weren't able to correct. Uh, and two is that uh, we're not following all the way through the, the chain of outcomes. But I, I think it, it, it's, it cost us $7,000 and uh, not a lot of time uh, to get done. So this, you know, the nominal uh, uh, goal of the paper is to look at soil health cards uh, in India. Uh, fertilizer use has grown dramatically from 10 kilograms per hectare to 128 kilograms per hectare over the past 40 years. There's now growing concern not just about overuse, but also uh, suboptimal uh, fertilizer choice. So if farmers don't know which, which nutrients are deficient in their soil, they might not know which fertilizers to apply. This applies especially for uh, micronutrients. Uh, so the government has uh, taken a very uh, bold, strong step in to d d distribute 140 million farmer soil health cards uh, by the end of the year. And they've committed to every three years giving farmers a refreshed, updated uh, soil health card. And so if you, if, if you don't own a farm, you haven't gotten one of these uh, delivered to you. Uh, but this is what they look like. This is uh, an example from Gujarat, which became the model for the national soil health card uh, distribution scheme. And so to me, this wouldn't mean anything. Uh, I don't read Gujarati. Uh, but it turns out that a lot of Gujaratis also don't read gu Gujarati, right? Because illiteracy is something like 30%. Uh, uh, in, in rural Gujarat. Uh, this, is, this is what the soil health card uh, provides in English, which is uh, quite a lot of information, actually. So, uh, and, and I think for us, this would actually be a very uh, useful uh, design. It, it, it lists the crops down the left-hand side. It starts off with the crop they believe the farmer has chosen, in this case, a hybrid unirrigated cotton. It gives uh, advice, both in terms of what nutrients the farmer needs, but also in terms of the quantity of fertilizer, kilograms, per hectare of urea, DAP, and MOP. Uh, unfortunately, again, in Gujarat, most people think in terms of biga, which is a different unit of area rather than hectare. So, so just trying to make that, that, that translation can be challenging. Uh, but then it goes on to give uh, information for another 20 crops uh, and some more information on, on micronutrients. Right? So, so this, is, this is what the government of Gujarat came with. You can imagine, uh, uh, and these are personalized. These, the, the, there's, the name is printed on the card. It says, we came and we tested your soil plot, and this is what we think uh, you should do. They're, they're making great progress in getting these uh, soil health cards out, uh, at least according to the, the website reporting uh, progress, with uh, you know, up to 8 million distributed in Madhya Pradesh, 12 million in Maharashtra, 26 million uh, soil heart health cards distributed in uh, UP. And this is, I think, something like $85 million initiative. Uh, I, I think that might be annual. So we're not the first person uh, to, to observe that these soil health cards may not be immediately transparent to everybody. And I want to highlight in particular a study by IFPRI, uh, which was uh, led by Ram Fishman, who's a 
was at Georgetown is now in, in Israel, and or actually he was on it. Maybe it's just his name comes first in the alphabet, but uh, uh, it was initiated by IFPRI, uh, and th they said, we understand the government's aiming to do this. Let's do sort of a dry run uh, with a small sample of farmers and, and see what we get out of it. And they, they started with 800 farmers in Bihar, provided the soil health cards to the farmers, explained the results. They found, they then went back a few months later and found no discernible effect on fertilizer use. So farmers didn't seem to be changing behavior. They evaluated farmers' willingness to pay for zinc. And a lot of farmers, the, the soil health card had uh, identified a lack of zinc in the soil. They found no effect there. Uh, and the, so the farmers could kind of recall what was on their soil health card. It had been explained to them, but they ne nevertheless believed their fields were zinc deficient, even if the soil test said their, their fields had enough zinc. And so in some sense, the, the, the view is, is that wasn't a terribly successful intervention or, or you know, there's a real challenge if, if we want to bring this to scale. So what we're doing in this paper is really just looking at a few steps in the theory of change, right? So the, the, the model you would imagine is the farmer tests the soil, provides the information to the farmer. We, the sorry, the government tests the soil, that's right, provides the, the information to the farmer. The soil health card has to contain useful information about the farmer's field. If it's pure noise, then the, the, the theory of change kind of breaks down. The farmer has to understand what's on the soil health card. They have to, or perhaps they, they can go to an extension worker or an agri dealer and say, here's my soil health card, please help me interpret it. Uh, they have to trust and believe that this is the right recommendation, and then they have to actually act on it. And so the, the, we're going to get all the way up to four. We're not going to talk about five in this paper, but we have an ongoing field study uh, that I'll mention uh, at the end that's going to examine uh, five. Okay. So, uh, Sorry, I, 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 there's an important disclaimer, which is that I am also the board member and co-founder of a nonprofit called Precision Agriculture uh, for Development, which uh, I founded with Michael Kramer and uh, a few other people to promote uh, ICT delivery of ag information to farmers around the world. We're working in India, Pakistan, uh, Kenya right now. Uh, I'm, I'm trying not to make this a pitch for the nonprofit or the goals of the nonprofit, I, although maybe that's in the spirit of the, the, the policy forum that they want the academics to get roll up their sleeves and get involved in policy. So if you know anybody who would be interested in talking about this or, or other things, I'd be happy to engage with them. But this, is, you know, this talk is going to focus until the last slide just on, on, on the academic uh, paper that's part of uh, IPF. But you know, the, the, the broad motivation for this is that mobile penetration is very high. If anybody knows good recent data on rural mobile penetration, I think that would make the paper a little bit stronger. There's as many SIM cards as people in India. So, so in general, penetration is pretty high. Although if you go into rural Odisha, you get something like 50 or 60% of farmers uh, reporting having active uh, cell connections. But that's orders of magnitude higher than uh, any of the other uh, standard outreach methods. So on average, the aver agricultural extension uh, workers see about 6% of farmers uh, in India in, in a given year from the NSS. Uh, you know, the good news may be uh, if, 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 you're, uh, if you have distributional concerns is that it seems like they're just as likely to see smallholder farmers as largeholder farmers, uh, but it's, it's just not, it's not yet moving the needle. You can't expect that if you distribute soil health cards, they're going to be, be, be there to, to explain uh, them to every uh, farmer. A lot of farmers turn to other farmers for advice or to the radio, TV, or newspaper. Uh, but the majority of farmers in India, at least, are not getting any sort of technical advice, uh, at, at least according to the NSS. So uh, I, I think if one immediate uh, thought is that if the government's not providing the advice and advice matters, you might expect the private sector to provide advice, and you might expect farmers to be willing to pay uh, for that advice or, or, or to seek it out, right? And uh, that's certainly the case. I think if you ask farmers, where do you, where do you get information, uh, the, the second or third most common uh, provider, which didn't make it onto this slide, is, oh, no, private commercial agents uh, or ag agri-dealers. So they'll just go down to the agri-dealer and say, I'm planting, planting this type of cotton, or what, what type of cotton should I plant? They'll give you a recommendation, and they'll tell you uh, what type of fertilizers to apply with that. So uh, as part of a, a, another study, that, but we, we didn't put it in, in that other paper, we did a, an audit study characterizing the quality of advice by agri-dealers. We basically sent surveyors who were, were trained in agronomy into agri-dealer shops to sit there for the day and record the questions that people are asking the agri-dealers and record their answers. Okay. Uh, pretty simple. We offered 100 rupees compensation to the agri-dealers. We didn't tell them we were, we were uh, evaluating the quality of their advice. We just said we're trying to understand consumer uh, purchasing behavior. 90% uh, of the people we approach agreed. So this is representative for these two blocks uh, in Gujarat. 
And then we brought the, the questions and the answers to a, a, a team of agronomists and asked them to characterize the quality of the advice that the agronomists, that the agri-dealers provided. So in about 40% of the cases, uh, there wasn't enough information. The, the agronomists would say, well, that might be the right advice, that might be the wrong advice, I don't know enough about the plot or, or the person's circumstances to be able to say that's good advice or bad advice. But uh, in the 60% of the time where they could make a, a determination, they were much more often to actually strongly disagree with the advice than to strongly uh, agree. And a lot of the nature of the, the disagreement was in terms of pesticide recommendation and uh, the, the fact that the agri-dealers appeared to recommend too many pesticides and too much use of pesticide. And I actually had an undergraduate uh, at Harvard who wrote his senior thesis on this. And it's, you know, it's basically a model of if I trust the agri-dealer and I buy all these pesticides and use them, my pests will die, right? I'll, and, and so uh, I, it's hard for me to update my priors or, or, or to learn that, that I'm buying too much pesticide. So, so, so the claim was maybe that's how this bad information equilibrium uh, could predict, persist. It's a, not too unrelated to the life insurance uh, discussion we had yesterday, where uh, uh, you know the private market can uh, deliver uh, over a long period of time uh, not very efficacious products uh, for consumers. So uh, in this uh, study, we proposed a very simplified soil health card, keeping in mind that a lot of farmers are illiterate and have very low levels of education. And you know, the, the principle is just less is more, right? The, the, key thing, the key reason for issuing these soil health cards is to get farmers to use the right quantities of fertilizer. And so let's just give them that information. That gives them, and let's make it accessible to them in terms of uh, per biga rather than per hectare. And so there's a simplified soil health card, which just gives the number of uh, kilogram per biga that you would need for these four different uh, uh, inputs. In addition uh, to a simplified health card, we said, well, ICT is getting so cheap now in India. Mobile penetration is so high. Let's see if we can complement this with uh, audio or video messages, uh, which, which could be delivered at scale at, at, at very low cost. Uh, and so and the advantage of this is that these messages can now be very easily customized. So the message can say, dear Shekhar, we've tested your field and it was found deficient in uh, nitrogen and you need to apply 93 kilograms of nitrogen per biga. And you, know, you just get a computer to, to generate a million messages and it'll do that in, in three minutes time and then, then you can send them out. So you can actually do, you could do that with voiceover or video clips uh, as well. I think, so, so that's a power of ICT. Uh, Another beauty of that, I think, is that it's very standardized, right? So when you send people out into the field, you don't know what they're going to do. You know, they might just sit in a tea shop all day and come back and report that they provided education to 200 farmers. But if you're sending out voice messages to farmers, the, 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 the phone platform will record that the farmer picked up. They listen to 65 seconds of the 70 second message and you know exactly what they heard, right? So it, it, it takes some of the human management problems out of the last mile of, of rural extension. And the cost is, is not you know, close to trivial. So an eight minute message at the prices we're paying with this nonprofit is about 3.2 rupees. Uh, the soil, soil test cost 150 to 250 rupees. So it's really a tiny fraction of, of what they're doing. Uh, the video might, might be higher, but actually even at a, a off the shelf data plan, it'd be about three, three rupees to send uh, a, an eight minute video. The, 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 the main cost would be, does the farmer actually have a phone with a video? So, in the area in Gujarat where we're working, and Gujarat is already a state that doesn't qualify for Gates grants because it's not a priority state, they're too rich. We're observing that our farmers, only 20% of them have smartphones, and of those, only 10% 10 10 have any sort of active data package. And they're mostly just using WhatsApp. So, so, so for us, for now, I think in the, in the very short term, the next one, two, three years, I think it's probably important for the government to, or whoever's distributing uh, information, to continue to focus on voice to, to have the maximum outreach possible although there are huge advantages to uh, a data-driven uh, platform. And the social costs of delivering this information are actually basically zero. The cell towers are built. They're not congested in rural areas. And it's then just the time of the, the staff to, to, to load up the messages and distribute them and you know, any, any sort of cost allocation you'd want to make to the original uh, CapEx. OK, so I, I want to just do a two-minute uh, tangent to talk about why we thought ICT could help people understand the soil health cards. And that's uh, Nilesh Fernando, who's a PhD student of mine and I at Harvard, did an RCT evaluating a mobile phone-based uh, extension service for smallholder farmers in, in Gujarat. And it was a very simple RCT, uh, 400 pure control, 400 got the phone extension, 400 got the phone extension plus an in-person session. There was a, a concern that maybe people aren't going to trust just an audio message. They want to see someone 
uh, uh, to believe the messages. Very simple, five minute push call once a week, delivering messages that are relevant to that geography and to that time period. And then people could call in and ask a question, record it on a, on a voicemail box, and then our agronomist would listen to the question. If they've already answered the question, they would send the recording of the answer that they recorded earlier back to the farmer. If they hadn't answered the question, they would record a new answer, send it back to the farmer. So right now we have, you know, uh, we're getting three or 400 questions a day, and you can handle that with uh, one, ag one agronomist, one or two agronomists uh, managing it. Uh, so we didn't create the platform. It was created by Neil Patel and Tapan Parikh, uh, who are computer scientists who are focused on human-machine interaction. So we found in a random sample of cotton farmers, we found very high take-up. So 63% of the people actually called in and asked a question so that that technological barrier didn't seem to be too severe. They listened to about two hours of uh, content over a two-year period. And they reported that for these are treatment effects. How, what fraction of people in the treatment group reported cell phones as the main source of information for the following topics? And you know, we moved the needle a lot on cotton pesticides and cotton fertilizers and cumin. There's no effect on price, which was reassuring because we weren't providing any price information. So it wasn't. It wasn't. It doesn't seem like it was a surveyor demand effect. And uh, we had. So, substantial and statistically significant effects on agricultural practices. So people seemed to take our advice uh, when they were making uh, pest treatment decisions, when they were making fertilizer practice decisions, when they were making sowing and input practice decisions. And we had some, I, I would say, good but not slam dunk evidence of increase in yields. So the, the, po the point estimate uh, on cumin yields was a 33% increase off of a relatively low base uh, and a 10% increase in cotton yields, uh, statistically significant at the 10% level. Uh, but if you, know, if you take that point estimate at face value, you're generating $10 in extra income for every $1 you invest in the service because it's so cheap to deliver this type of information. And that's at this tiny, tiny scale. If you're bringing up, up to, to a large scale, then the cost per farmer would go down dramatically. But I think we need to be careful here because the, the, there's actually not that much evidence. ITC, ICT for Ag see, may seem like a no-brainer. But there's, the evidence is actually mixed, right? So there's a RML was one of the first uh, movers in this space, and uh, one of my colleagues wrote an HBS case study on how great it was. Uh, but then uh, uh, Marcel Fafchamp and his colleague did an impact evaluation and found no no effect uh, of the service on on the farmers who got it, and and so the evidence base is still accumulating. Okay, so back to soil soil test uh, evaluation. What the government is doing is they're testing soil nutrient levels, and then they're recommending low, medium, or high levels of fertilizer application. Or sorry, they're they're characterize they're not they're characterizing your soils having either low, medium, or high levels of these these important nutrients, and then they're giving you an, a recommendation for the quantity of fertilizers uh, you should apply. So, one part of this study we're doing uh, involves doing our own soil tests, uh, where we were able to make sure that we're pretty confident that the the, the plot we tested is actually mapped to the, the data we get back from the lab because we supervise the, the testing and the movement of the soil to the lab and back. And uh, we, uh, we, we, did, we tested, uh, how much, 800 plots, is that right, 1,600? Uh, 800 plots, and we were able to match 300 of those plots to government soil health cards. Okay, so we could compare what the government was saying about the plots to what our own tests uh, said. And here, the news is not very encouraging. So the, this is the correlation of the government uh, reported le le nutrient level and our level of nutrient. And the correlation is you can never reject a zero correlation uh, between the two sources of, of data. Uh, so that uh, gives us pause. And there's one possibility, which is we just really screwed up, right? You, you can't discount that. Our sampling frame happened to uh, oversample some. We, we asked different people in the village, what's your main plot? And then we went and sampled that. It turns out we sometimes got cousins who had the same main plot. So we did a bunch of double tests of plots. In that setting, we actually find a, a relatively high correlation between the results for our own tests. So at, at least our own tests are not pure noise. But I think the, the hope that uh, a single precise test can provide a durable uh, piece of information to farmers is, is right now not yet realized. And I think some like Erie and, and IFPRI are also moving to more uh, aggregate or Krieging or interpolation uh, type models rather than individual uh, soil tests. You know, an, another implication of, 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 of the difference is that the, the recommendations that come out of the tests are quite different between what our soil health cards would recommend and what the government soil health cards recommend. It's not just that the, the mean level measured is different, but that translates into different characterizations of the quality of the nutrient and the amount of fertilizer that should be recommended. Okay. So the summary is that that's uh, one, one challenge in this causal chain is, are we sure that the, the soil health cards the government is distributing are providing high quality 
uh, information about the, the, so the soil quality. So we then move to an experiment to, to try to understand how people understand these soil health charts. And this is, you can think, you know, this is something the U.S. government does all the time before they do a disclosure about adjustable rate mortgages. They'll bring in a few hundred people. They'll try out three different dis disclosures, and they'll see which disclosure uh, people understand more. And then they'll recommend that, that uh, disclosure. So it's a, sort of a lab in the field experiment with 600 farmers from 12 villages in Gujarat. And the goal is to just measure the effect of the simplified health card and the uh, additional uh, ICT-based explanation. Now, we, it, it would have been logistically too challenging in three weeks' time to match farmers to their soil and go out there. It would have been very, very costly. So instead, we just said, we're going to give you the soil test of a cousin. You know, imagine this is your cousin. We want you to read the soil health card and tell us what recommendations you would make for your cousin. And to incentivize them to actually pay attention, we said, we're going to ask you a question at the end. And if you get questions about uh, input use at the end, and if you get it right, you'll get 10 rupees of cell phone top up right away for each question you get correct. So they had some motivation to pay attention and try to answer the question because uh, they could walk away with uh, 30 rupees uh, if, or 40 rupees if they got it right. So this is the design we intended to sub submit to human subjects, uh, which would have had uh, a, a, a two by four design with either the original soil health card or the original health, soil health card and the simplified soil health card and then either soil health card, soil health card plus audio, soil health card plus video, soil health card plus agronomist. We actually sent an agronomist out in the field. This isn't because we think this is a scalable intervention, but we wanted to measure audio and video against that benchmark of an actual live person because uh, we had a prior that live person would be the most powerful intervention. Unfortunately, and uh, this is my fault, we, this is the sub design we submitted to human subjects and were therefore bound to do. If, if this hadn't been the IPF, we would have just waited three weeks to get the human subjects revised and uh, uh, updated the field experiment, but we wanted to have something to, to talk. I didn't want to be talking to an empty room in a month's time. I wanted to be talking to all of you. Um, so what we can't, you know, the, the cost of that is now we can't unbundle the difference between the soil, the simplified soil health card and the audio or video or agronomist, right? So uh, we will do that uh, uh, in, 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 in Gujarat very soon, uh, but right now we're stuck with this. Now, I don't think this is a terrible constraint because the cost of a simplified soil health card is exactly the same as the cost of a complicated soil health card. So the intervention is still very policy relevant. It just uh, doesn't help us understand the mechanisms as well. Okay. So the scripts that in the audio, video, and agronomist were virtually identical. They explained why nutrient status matters and how fertilizer affects nutrient status and why soil tests help you measure uh, nutrient status. They then gave the recommendations in kilograms per viga. And they also said, this was a feedback we got from a lot of farmers, was that, well, I think it, the amount of fertilizer I should apply depends a lot on the quality of the rainfall. And so the scripts all acknowledge that these are the baseline recommendations, and they may, you, you may want to adjust them based on uh, the amount of rain you get. Uh, and we focus just on, on, on cotton. Okay. So who are these people in our sample? They're people who are using the, the service that I talked about earlier. They're getting a, a call once a week. 70% of them are literate, 99% are male, 30, average age of 35, almost everybody's growing cotton, with an irrigate, most have an irrigated plot. Only a quarter of them know what a soil test is, and only 7% of them know about the soil health card scheme. So uh, either uh, we picked an unrepresentative district in Gujarat, or the reports of Gujarat having distributed 60% of soil health cards uh, might not represent the, the reality uh, on the ground. Okay. So the first was just a baseline understanding. We give them the government soil health card in Gujarati, and we say, how much urea, DAP, or MOP should you plant? Uh, and the, the, the farmer could answer in any unit they wanted. They could say per square kilometer. They could say per hectare, per biga. Most answered in biga, and most got it wrong. Uh, and so, so the, the fraction of people who could actually figure it out is about 6% uh, based, based on the official government soil health card. Uh, and the government uh, itself sponsored a study very recently that found that about 17% can't understand fertilizer calculations. So we're, uh, we both acknowledge there's a problem. We seem to, in this sample, have found a larger uh, fraction of people having a challenge understanding it. This is a test of balance. So we randomly assigned people to just get the soil health card, get the soil health card plus audio plus video or plus the agronomist, and the experiment was, was balanced. There's not a lot of uh, systematic variation. Okay. Level, we also asked, how much do you trust the soil health card? And this was not incentivized. And we've actually found a relatively high level of trust. 65% said they, they have some level of trust. About 35% uh, 30, said they, they, they are, or no, actually 60% they've said they fully trust it. 
Uh, we then looked at the, this is the, the, the main table from the experiment, which is what's the effect of our intervention. And you see it's, it's a pretty big effect. So we go from 6% of the people being able to answer the question, how much fertilizer should I buy for my land, to 37% in the audio intervention, 41% in the video, and 41% in the agronomist. Okay, so from 6 to 40% with this very simple uh, intervention. Uh, and something that surprised us was that the audio and the video did about as well as the agronomist. I expected there to be a big, big difference between having somebody in person explain it to you. Now, we didn't let the agronomist sort of point to the answer when we were asking them the question, right? We had the agronomist explain the soil health card, and then, then the, 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 the test was given. But still, I would have thought uh, I certainly pay more attention to live uh, rather than, than, than video information. So that was a little bit of a surprising. On the trust, how much do you trust the, the information here? Here we did find a bigger effect from the, the agronomist's presence versus audio and video. So the baseline level of trust was already pretty high, but only the live in-person agronomist here moved the needle uh, up. The agronomist also increased farmers' reported willingness to pay for uh, soil tests. We said, would you be willing to enter a lottery where you have to pay 200 rupees to get a soil test? Yes or no. And so that's a measure of, of, of their willingness to pay. Uh, and then we look at knowledge, and here we have both the video and the agronomist having some positive effect on levels of knowledge. So do you know what soil fertility is? Why do we do soil testing? Which fertilizers uh, affect which chemicals? Uh, the audio was, was less effective in, in moving knowledge, but uh, the point estimates were positive. We can also do a within subject uh, analysis uh, by comparing, you know, because we first gave them the soil health card and asked them for their views. And then we either assigned them no for their information, audio, video, or agronomist, and asked their views. So we can basically put an individual fixed effect uh, in there. We get more power there. And then we find also that the audio message is, is effective in increasing trust uh, in the soil health card. One other thing I think that's interesting uh, uh, is to see how this fares for illiterate versus literate farmers. Uh, you might think that even the simplified health card might not be useful to illiterate farmers if they, if they can't read. And here we find that the Indeed, the baseline level of understanding uh, for illiterate farmers is basically zero. Uh, but the audio, video, and agronomist all increase uh, their ability to, to characterize the correct amount of fertilizer to buy. And the effect size is about 15 to 20 percent. Uh, the, the effect size of the interventions on literate people is even higher, right? So it may be that literate people learn better uh, or... or uh, uh, but, but in any case, you know, we, we think that the... This may provide a lower bound of the effect of just the audio intervention without the simplified soil health card, uh, if, if you really think it is. And they were allowed to listen to the message multiple times before turning to the, to the question, and, and many of them cho chose to do so. OK. So uh, that, that's the simple lab in the field experiment. Cost $7,000, uh, no, cost uh, uh, $5,000 to do and, and a few weeks' time. Uh, that's not counting the principal investigator's time costs, I guess. Uh, <laughs> But uh, we're now doing a, a larger scale two-year field experiment looking at uh, soil health cards, simplified soil health cards, and simplified soil health cards plus audio support with 3,600 farmers. So we'll come back to you with actual uh, input impact results uh, in a couple of years' time. But here, Arvind's critique uh, certainly applies. Uh, we've replicated the, the first study with Nilesh Fernando in Madhya Pradesh. There we found, again, systematic changes in behavior, but not effects on yield there. Uh, although the, the <clears throat> estimate was sufficiently noisy that we could have had a 10% uh, gain in yield there. We're, we're continuing work in Gujarat, looking at price information, aggregating demand for inputs and outputs. And, and now I guess I'll talk a little bit about the nonprofit, but we're working with, uh, we're trying to work with the Odisha government, the Coffee Board of India. Uh, our director was just in the state, the, met the principal secretary of a large state in India yesterday, and he walked into a meeting where he was meeting the principal secretary for agriculture, and the team was complaining about farmers are complaining they can't understand the soil health cards. Uh, and that's before we even opened our mouth. So uh, suggests that the work is at least relevant to, to immediate uh, government uh, policy uh, concerns. Two minutes. Yeah, excellent. So I should say uh, this is coordinated work with Michael Kramer. He's doing a bunch of work uh, in Africa, and he's shown evidence in Africa there that SMS can improve uh, sugar yields for certain farmers. I think. Uh, and there, again, the simple design problems are evident. So the, the first time you do it, the government of Kenya sent out a message saying, if your soil has a pH of less than 5.5, use lime. Nobody knows what pH is. Nobody knows what their pH is. So they found no effect. But if you send out a message saying, lime reduces soil acidity, soil tests in your areas say you should apply lime, 
then you find some some effect. And so so these are not huge effects, right? We're not doubling farmers' income, uh, but they're huge relative to the cost of delivering them. And so you know I think the challenge of, in economics is to say things that are not obvious and true. And so I tried to think what 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 you could take away from here. Uh, soil tests. In, as being distributed in, good, in, in India now may not uh, may have limited accuracy, and the understanding of basic cards is uh, very low, especially for illiterate populations. But a very simple low cost, three rupees cost to, to deliver this message uh, to farmers can dramatically improve uh, understanding. Uh, and I think there's uh, the, the evidence on literacy and illiteracy also, I think, helps suggest how this information itself could be customized to the farmer, not just based on their soil test results, but their level of literacy, their access to inputs, uh, their willingness to take risks, and, and could, could be actually much more effective uh, at, at almost uh, no real uh, increase in costs. So the aspiration, and, and I'm, this is my last slide and I'm concluding, is, is to come up with something that's like Netflix for agriculture. So if you know Netflix in the US is a movie service, I guess you have in India too, and it, it knows what you watch, it's like Spotify, and then it starts seeing what you like and what you don't like and it makes recommendations for you. Don't know what to watch, watch this next, we think you'll like it. So if we can coordinate ICT extension platforms around the world, we're working in, in, in two states or soon work. Yeah, we're actually already working in Gujarat and Odisha. We're working in Punjab, Pakistan, Kenya, and Uganda. Build up large multi-country database of agricultural practices and outcomes. Run hundreds or thousands of AP te AB tests with millions of farmers to figure out how to convey information effectively, collect information <laughs> for farmers, promote behavior change, customize these recommendations by, by, by all sorts of farmer characteristics. I think this could be a dramatic uh, improvement or help promote dramatic improvement in agricultural productivity. Now, there are a ton of private sector solutions out there, and they're way more advanced than the stuff. They're, they're a lot more sophisticated than the stuff that we've talked about. We're really focusing on stuff that's going to work with illiterate, poor, mass market uh, population. And I think the space is large enough to accommodate both the pri private sector and the public uh, sector solutions. But we do think there may be a case for public sector support of this type of initiative, because understanding how to improve agricultural productivity is in some sense a global public good. What we learn in India is actually beneficial to Pakistan, but the Indian Ag Ministry may not have an incentive to go to Pakistan and uh, share their learnings. Uh, you know, it's hard to collect money from, from farmers, especially smallholder farmers, uh, and so the, the transaction costs may, may prevent uh, something that would otherwise be a very good idea. And we've seen, for example, in the life insurance setting that private markets for information might not uh, function well. If you have people who are providing information but are also selling you products or promoting products, you can end up with uh, a bad, bad, bad outcomes in equilibrium. And so there may be some case for a, a neutral party to provide advice and guidance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first discussant will be Pramod Joshi from IFPRI. Good morning to everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate um, Sean Call and Garima for excellent uh, paper. It's something different from the stream which especially agricultural economists are doing. And I'm also happy that this is uh, uh, you know, adding to one of our earlier studies in Bihar. If we did a very interesting study in Bihar on, on soil health cards. And our results were not very uh, impressive. And we concluded that perhaps we selected a wrong state. So <laughs> in Bihar, you don't get any good results. Uh, <laughs> But I am happy that uh, similar kinds of results we are getting in, in Bihar. Uh, but you, you will agree with me that you know, this fertilizer sector is receiving uh, considerable attention uh, from government and also from researchers from various uh, angles. One is uh, it's adding to our fiscal deficit. Huge subsidies are going to fertilizer sector. Around $11 billion of subsidy is going to fertilizer sector and government would like to uh, you know save a lot of subsidy this a large part of subsidy which is going to uh, fertilizer sector the second is it is the imbalanced use of fertilizer and many times excessive use of fertilizer especially nitrogenous fertilizer is also degrading our you know precious soil and water resources and third is uh, it is also contributing to greenhouse gas emission and agriculture, you know, is contributing in India, especially 20% to the greenhouse gas emission. 
and one of the major factor is rice plus fertilizers. So this is a big sector which we need to control for reducing greenhouse gas emission. And fourth, it is also you know, adversely affecting health. Many of you may be knowing there is a train known as cancer train, which starts from Bhatinda, goes to Bikaner, is largely because of excessive use of chemicals, fertilizers, and pesticide. And you know, it is deteriorating water quality. And people living there are adversely affected due to cancer. And there's a train known as the cancer train. And government is taking a lot of initiative to improve the fertilizer use efficiency, uh, save uh, fertilizer. Recently, the new uh, price policy was initiated. Direct benefit transfer is another uh, area which is receiving a lot of uh, interest. Lots of pilots are in progress. And third is the neem coated urea. It is also going to reduce a large amount of you know, leakages. You will be surprised we are doing an informal study between India and Nepal. 70% of Nepal's fertilizer meat, fertilizer requirement is from the informal fertilizer sector, fertilizer going to the Nepal from Bihar. So, uh, so this spill phrase or leakage is, is being reduced. And last one is the soil health card. And this is a flagship program for government of India. And Gujarat, it was done long back. Uh, it came at the central uh, government level when the, the new government came into power. The Soil Health Card is a flagship program. And successive budget, uh, it is receiving a uh, lot of resources to, uh, to test the soils. And uh, the soil test-based nutrient management is a new phenomenon in Indian agriculture. So this study uh, is a step forward what we have done in Bihar, where it was only soil health card. We did something on uh, zinc uh, also, in addition to soil health card. Uh, the recommendations for zinc, which is another nutrient, important nutrient for, especially for rice. Rice requires a lot of zinc, and in the absence of zinc, there's a disease known as khera, uh, which is the crop is adversely affected, yields are affected. And we did some uh, choice experiments on zinc and tried to see the willingness to pay for zinc. And to our surprise, uh, the willingness to pay uh, was almost same, whether the farmers having uh, adequate zinc in the soil or deficient in, this, in the soil. And this study is a value of addition to our understanding on soil health card by adding uh, the, uh, the role of ICT uh, in linking with the soil health card. This is a, a sort of innovation. And this uh, is with the uh, thing premise that the digital India is progressing. But in agriculture sector, uh, digital um, you know, is applications are very, very weak. So through these kinds of experiment, I think we can bring digital in agriculture sector as well. This study starts with the two broad uh, conclusions. One is that uh, when the soils were tested by authors and also by the, uh, separately by the government department, and there was very weak correspondence between these two uh, soil tests. Uh, the recommendations from one uh, you know, government agencies, which we the authors did were uh, different. So this is one major issue, and we need to uh, identify why this discrepancy is there. While the government will take up lots of uh, soil tests uh, everywhere, you know, the, 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 the uh, civil society organizations or farmers themselves cannot go for uh, soil tests. So why this kind of discrepancy? Is it because of methodology, or is it because of uh, taking samples uh, properly, or there was proper moisture in the soil. So there are lots of factors which uh, can have different uh, recommendations uh, from the soil. This is one issue which we need to flag and bring this to the authorities, that why there is a discrimination between different tests. The second is the premise is that we have a poor extension agency. Uh, roughly one extension personnel has to attend r around 1,000 farmers, or more than 1,000 in some cases. So you cannot attend all the farmers in person. So uh, the recent reports from NSSO reveal that 
uh, majority of the farmers are accessing information from the progressive farmers. And progressive farmers are linked with the, these extension agents, Krishi Vigyan Kendra, State Agriculture Universities, and accessing information and passing these to them. And the farmers uh, are not directly in touch with the extension personnel. So here comes the role of ICT, how we can make uh, the power of ICT uh, useful for the farming community by providing uh, the messages. So they have taken up uh, you know, four uh, treatments. One is the soil health card recommendations, and then giving audio messages, and also the video messages. And fourth was a visit by the uh, expert, agronomist basically, uh, so these are the four broad uh, treatments they have selected for the for the study. On only on soil health card, uh, the, which we also found that uh, there was no difference in application of fertilizers, uh, whether you uh, have a um, soil card or you don't have soil card. So there is no difference between the application of uh, fertilizer. So various three, the broad three regions were identified. Our study also identified three uh, regions. One was that poor comprehension about these soil health cards. Farmers are not uh, very uh, sure, or they don't comprehend the idea of, uh, of the soil-based soil nutrient management. And they have a prescribed limit that, uh, you know, 50 kilograms of urea in one katta in one acre. So this is a normal rule. And they follow this practice, so rather than having a precise that 45 kilograms per this much area. So they have a, a generic recommendation uh, for themselves, and I think which is easier also for them. So they don't comprehend that they should go for this kind of precision. And the second is the poor trust. They are also not trusting this recommendation, and which is a fact that the study has pointed out. There are two different kinds of uh, recommendations coming from different agencies. So there is a poor trust also among uh, farmers for uh, these soil health cards. And third is that they fear loss in the productivity. If they feel that if they reduce the uh, fertilizer consumption, their yields will go down. Uh, so this is another fear and they don't go for with these, with these recommendations. I feel that there are three more uh, regions, maybe there may be three more regions for not uh, going for these kinds of recommendation. One is that these recommendations are based on agronomic trials. And agronomy uh, trials, they are giving recommendation where the yields are maximum. For example, where our marginal physical productivity in the production function is zero. The productivity is highest. At that level, these are the recommendations. And the experiments are being conducted in a very uh, precise environment. They were very small, small plots, maybe uh, three meter by three meter or maximum six meter by six meter. So very precision agriculture kind of thing is being done while the farmer has a large plot. Uh, and the farmer is also, farmer is not maximizing yield, farmer is maximizing profit. Where they incorporate the prices of fertilizer and the prices of output. So in this particular case, uh, the price of, you know, this was cotton, the so crop is same, but the price of fertilizer farmers are farmers also take into consideration. Therefore, they adjust use of fertilizer with the price, and they don't go with the maximum yield, but the maximum profit kind of situation. And third, the farmers have their own response function, which is which we, we try earlier we used to do these kinds of analysis, which is much below than the agronomist uh, uh, production function or response function. It's much lower because of several reasons, the holding size there, the, his own resource endowments, socioeconomic uh, uh, characteristics. So based on that, his response function is lower, and he follows his own response function. Therefore, they you do not go for with the recommendations, which as a researcher or agronomist or economist are suggesting to the farmer. This is one region which I would like to flag, and we need to work on this uh, uh, for future recommendations. The second is that the financial constraints. Many times farmers, they have the financial constraints, do not access uh, credit, especially small and marginal farmers in remote areas, and they do not go with the full recommendation which is being uh, given. Third reason which I feel is they cover for risk also. Now the frequent droughts, floods, or sudden rainfall, all, everything is happening and there's a risk in agriculture. So to cover risk, they are not putting uh, 
uh, resources on, on fertilizer. So uh, this study, uh, which has you know, added advantage of including ICT, audio, and uh, <coughs> video, uh, and also visit of, of agronomists. Uh, and in all these situations where we have audio, or video, and uh, the visit of agronomists, there is an improvement. We also observed in one of our studies in, uh, in, in Bangladesh that you know, one visit of expert is not making difference. Two widgets are also not making difference. Three widgets are also not making difference. You know, the farmer has to put money on it. And they have to put resources. So they will not be convinced in one widget, two widgets. So they will just observe what other farmers are doing. So in the first two widgets, few farmers are convinced. And maybe at the fourth widget, they will be convinced. So we have to think of how we can improve the perception of the farmers about soil test-based uh, nutrient management. So audio-visual. AIDS, audio, audio or visual, I think they have power to influence uh, farmers or convince farmers that if you go with these practices, their productivity may increase, their profitability may, may also, uh, also increase. So the, the results are very, very interesting and very, very uh, hopeful. Uh, I feel that we need to look forward, what we can do from here onward. Uh, I feel that whether we should go with the individual farmer's soil health card. It is good that we should convince farmers he should be sensitized about his soil. And uh, although I, wherever I have visited, I traveled a lot on the farmer's field, majority of the farmers are concerned about soil. They use farm, farmyard, wherever, farmyard manure, organic fertilizer every year, which has not been incorporated in many of these studies. We don't count the, uh, the a farmyard manure or compost which they are giving, a lot of nitrogen is there, carbon is there, phosphorus is there in those soils, uh, which often we do not incorporate in, in, in our studies. So what we should do, uh, what uh, individual farmer is, this is good that they should have soil health card, they should know about their soil. But for recommendation, what I feel that, should we not have, gen, you know, a, use the soil fertility maps? There are soil fertility maps already available with very uh, low, um, uh, you know, um, we take the maps, uh, very low resolution. So one is to 500 meter or one, one is to 2,500 meter. They have this kind of resolution. So if they, with the soil test maps are already there. How much is the nitrogen in the soil? How much is the phosphorus in the soil? How much is zinc in the soil? So these, la these soil maps, soil nutrient maps are already prepared by National Bureau of Soil Survey and Land Use Planning. Unfortunately, neither that institute nor we are using those soil nutrient maps. So if you have these maps available, and then there is not much difference between one farmer field and another farmer field with respect to soil fertility. So these maps can be used for generic recommendation. I don't care with five kilogram here or five kilogram there, less or more. If it is just more, 25 or 30 kilogram, that makes a big difference. But we can make a generic recommendation for a small, small patches. Maybe in one village, you can have four, four clusters and this cluster has, this is the requirement. So that will make easier for adoption of our uh, recommendation. This is one I would like, and we need to do some pilot on this area, that how we can make use of soil uh, maps and make the generic recommendation and see how individual farmers supply so soil health card. We say with these big, these you know, generic recommendation is going to help in future, which will also save cost and also make the difference. This second is we need to, as uh, we have seen in all, all these ex experiments, uh, tre treatments, uh, whether this is study or the earlier study by IFRI, mere giving soil health card is not making any difference. We have to add on. We have to, you uh, know, so uh, we need to link it with extension, either through ICT or in person. So I feel that, you know, ICT is a very powerful. We must use it. But second, there are already government programs are there. There are frontline demonstration, on-farm demonstration, and, and there are various programs under National Food Security Mission. So we need to link the soil health recommendation with, with, the, with the ongoing uh, frontline demonstration. So we can demonstrate to the farmers the, the risk which he has in mind that my productivity may go down if I follow the practices. This can be demonstrated, to the, and the demonstrations are already there. So we can link soil health card with these 
demonstration to change the perception of the farmers. Once they see from their own eyes that productivity is not declining, I think they will go with the recommendation. This is a second a point I look at. Yeah. The third one is the, uh, if we can, this is the soil test based nutrient. Can we use you know, the, the, the plant is also showing which nutrient is less in the, in the plant with the color. So CIMIT has done some experiment. They have leaf color chart. At every growth stage of the plant, different, you can see from the color of the leaf which nutrient is deficient. I am basically an agricultural uh, person, and I can tell you that which nutrient is deficient in the soil if, in the soil if I can see the, uh, the plant, whether it is zinc is less or nitrogen is less. So they have developed a leaf color chart, and once you use the leaf color chart over the crop, you can, you can recommend the, how much fertilizer is needed, which is very, very cost effective. So we can, in your next study, or you can add the leaf color chart, and CIMIT has done for a few crops, and you can know that how much. And fourth is, we are doing a lot of reform in the front end, but the, the reforms or the, you know, on the back end, especially in de designing technologies, there is very low effort. For example, now we can monitor our sugar, we can monitor our, our even our sleep, we can monitor. But we don't have simple equipments to monitor the soil health for the farmers. So back-end research to develop simple tools, simply, simple um, monitoring models are needed. And fifth is the, finally, uh, is the role of the private sector. As long as it will be with the government, I don't think that the, it may move forward. Government has already sensitized us. Now the private sector can take over it. What kinds of models will emerge on soil, on soil health? I, I feel that it will play a very significant role in future. And I also fully agree with authors that we should harness the power of ICT. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Sachid Madan. <coughs> Good morning. You know, normally when you get papers like what Cole and I mean, Sean and Garima have done, where they actually, uh, they, 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 it's very transparent. It talks about the limitations. It also talks about what are the changes they're going to, go, they learned from it and they're going to go and do forward. I don't know whether discussions are really needed. But I will try and comment a little bit about uh, Indian agriculture and get back to the paper. Look, very clearly, we all we all, we all are aware about the rural distress which is happening at this point of time, and therefore anything and everything we can do uh, to improve uh, that is, is very important. Physical uh, extension is going to be difficult. ICT is the route. But as the paper is titled, Promises and Challenges, I think globally there is so much attention happening on ICT in agriculture, and you know we've been looking at people doing everything, like the tractor, electrophotoscopy, uh, you know, looking at all kinds of diseases through plants and soil and, and just about everything, but not too many success stories, uh, but hopefully they will emerge. You know, nothing happens uh, very, very quickly at the end of the day. So really happy that you've taken this up more than anything else. Coming back into agriculture, you know, one of the things which we have and with some assumptions we talk about uh, folklore, we say that there's an excess application of fertilizer. We talk about there is a misapplication of fertilizer. <coughs> But you know, between 1970 and now, as a country, uh, from being uh, not able to feed our people, our farmers actually have pro are producing enough that we can export and we have a surplus. So that fertilizer is actually getting used somewhere. May not be the efficacy is maybe coming down. And the reason partly it is coming down is that our farms are not getting over farmed. We, there are places we are running three crops and therefore the soil nutrition is going down. The use of farmyard manure is coming down and therefore the need for extra chemical fertilizer is going up per se. The second thing which you also, there is misapplication most certainly as uh, Dr. Joshi mentioned that he's, he's maximizing his profitability like any entrepreneur is. If he's getting something cheap, he's using it. And therefore the subsidy to that extent is distorting it. But then you also again talk about yields and yield gaps. What we, what we sometimes forget is that in, in the US there is one crop, that summer crop which has a beautiful day length and so on and so forth. <laughs> In Punjab, there are three crops. So when you start looking at yield gaps, you need to look at the amount of sunlight that crop gets, the number of days that crop goes, and so on and so forth. And sometimes then the yield gaps don't look so wide. Obviously, there are pockets where the yield gaps are even greater. But it does happen. But I just wanted to get that across. Uh, uh, the, uh, 
I'll now move on to the area of soil health cards. It's a very, very new initiative. I think we need to see how it settles down, but it's a very, very bold initiative in any case. And as this paper has is, is probably come at a time very appropriate because you're putting all this money behind soil health cards, you have all this hope behind soil health cards, is it getting understood and communicated? But and therefore, let me start with the basic fundamental on the how good are the soil health cards. And I think I really love the fact that you were able to come to some conclusion that there are gaps. The work we have done is also showing a lot of gaps. These gaps, uh, whether they are because it's in early stages or whether it is happening because of uh, the fact that somebody is not doing it, the right job, I don't know. But these are gaps and the trust which our farmers have on many of these soil health cards are not. Uh, it isn't there. There are obviously some changes which will happen because, for example, if you take took a soil uh, sample after a, uh, let's say, a uh, corn crop, it takes a lot of resources and therefore you will find a different reading per se. But if you actually did it, you know, uh, after two or three seasons or two or three years, it, you will see uh, gaps. But we've also seen gaps where a soil which is acidic has become alkaline or alkaline, or more alkaline has become, uh, or sorry, acidic has become alkaline. Those become a little more discon disconcerting and therefore, uh, I think that's something which we really need to <coughs> work around. It doesn't seem to gel around what you want know, to talk about, 11 percent farmers have report soil sampling, only half have received soil cards and the government is claiming 66 percent. Maybe it's timing, but I think time would really tell what happens here, uh, per se. Into the second arena, uh, really, uh, on this only, I think the government, and you, you pointed this out in a paper rightly, the government realized this is possible, talks about a 1% audit, and I think you have rightly suggested that the 1% audit of, uh, should be done by an independent agency, resampled, put into the public domain, and we will look forward to see the data, because once that comes in, I think the rigor on the soil card will improve. And obviously, an ICT which is sitting on the soil card cannot be good if the soil card itself is not good. The second area and another foundation is this whole area of recommendation. Now, see, a lot of these recommendations were done donkeys years ago. Uh, they were done when the soil health itself was much different and they were done when the soil product, the, the farm productivity was very different. And as you know very clearly, the, 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 the amount of output is what is the amount of fertilizer which gets drawn. So, as productivity has changed, we have found in our experience, that our experience is largely in northern parts of India, uh, that there is a, the, the recommendations are lower than uh, what actually is getting used on the ground as compared to in your example in cotton you actually found and that's Gujarat so therefore they are obviously very different. So you will find across India that divergence. But I think those recommendations also need to be brought up to date. And you know, uh, finally, a lot of these recommendations have been done by universities uh, many years ago and who have not really been back into the ground again. So that again, that foundation needs to be strengthened is our, is our view more than anything else. The other thing is that it's, it's very complex. It's like you, you're going to a doctor, right? The doctor will have tests done and the doctor will then look at clinical symptoms. He will ask you multiple questions at the end of the day. So when you look at a soil health card, that also is very similar. Sometimes you need to look at some other uh, symptoms. Because what happens is, if the pH is high, obviously the recommendation on fertilizer has to be very different, number one. If the soil is sandy versus heavy, the recommendation on fertilizer has to be different. So you can't just say, this is what your soil health card is, this is what you are, uh, and, and you're not accounting for some of these things, and this is what the crop you're growing, so this should be the fertilizer. You need to start accounting and adjusting for many such things. <coughs> so a little more complex is all I'm kind of saying. The next area is the area of trust and I think you've covered that very well and I think you've also mentioned the fact that when, uh, look, uh, obviously if, if our farmers are skeptical about the soil health card, the trusting is going down. And I can understand his lack of trust in many, many ways because for him, that is, his, that is his livelihood. You are asking him to change something and he's so, he's so concerned about the fact is he going to get a good crop or not that there is, he, he will be skeptical and therefore we need to win over his trust per se. And, and clearly, as you have also pointed out, is that if you are talking about an advice being given for another guy as compared to an advice for your own farm, it is going to be vastly different. You know, somebody says, what you do recommend to your friend, uh, it's a different response. You don't think the same about it. What's, what are you going to do to your crop? And that's why I think getting all of this into the next stage, as you said, in your next 1800 sample is, how will it also drive action? And we also need to be very, very sure that we make the right recommendation so that we don't really have that poor farmer impacted in any one way. But trust will be very different, much more difficult when it is his own farm and he's got to do it 
himself and therefore that 90% level which we are talking about would be very very dubious very very difficult in that uh, sense so i think that ongoing study of 1800 farmers which you are doing is something we are really looking forward to and i think the learning you've had from this will give us a lot more uh, going forward you know one of the other things i could recommend on in the audio cues cues etc and that's what joshua also mentioned is the visual cues uh, like example that you know if you if you if somebody has got a short, uh, has ha is growing a particular crop and it actually has a deficiency of a particular uh, fertilizer or a micronutrient or macro or micronutrient there are some visual symptoms which are very obvious so actually if you cued that in your message that if you have seen you know it's like if you read the newspaper or magazine and somebody is selling telling you about diabetes and he'll give you 20 different things as to if this happens to this happens to you all of us will have diabetes in that sense but if there's one or two cues you can talk about that you may have noticed this or you may have noticed this in your crop all of a sudden he will perk up because he's now able to relate it to what he's seeing visually in addition to your message on uh, something else largely yellowing stunting things like that you know come out to be very important one of the things which uh, you have pointed out which is the nss uh, data i think is talking about 21% people relying on progressive farmers in our entire experience we have found that the progressive farmers are probably the best source of knowledge information what needs to be done and, and that is actually i'm very happy when you see that data of 21% it proves uh, that you know farmers also are going to them when a farmer is seeking information he is in a different mind space as compared to when he is getting information from outside and the fact that he is going and seeking that is good and that progressive farmer uh, has actually tried it himself he's got his own recommendations his yields are better that's why he's looked on uh, upon various people he actually gets soil tests done uh, it's not that he pays for it all the big companies are around him the pesticide company the seed company the fertilizer company he gets access to all those intelligentsia also so that's another big help uh, from his perspective so how can we leverage the progressive farmer it's a, it, he's he's also got a farm which is a physical demo farm so how do we leverage that into our it ict could be another way of um, uh, looking at this okay uh, uh, i'll quickly take 30 seconds really uh, so things like sharing success stories could be useful for people they are relating to creating awareness about the progressive farmers could be another one but the one item which i think plagues our uh, Uh, rural sector and farming most importantly is is really the surpluses so an ict which is able to help in predicting in telling farmers what is the planting which is happening going to happen how is the crop progressing warning the government that surpluses are likely before they actually get thrown on the roads may be another good uh, thing to look at thank you thank you very much <clears throat> okay we're running a little bit behind schedule but uh, we have time for questions so let me go around the room uh, starting with kirit a couple of observations one is uh, i want to know from uh, cole dr cole whether the gain in yield or profit uh, did you assess them and this should be assessed in some sense over time because there is also weather impact so how do you account for this because otherwise you don't really know whether this is working or not some questions i have to dr joshi haven't uh, agronomist this been carrying out yield um, experiment on farmers fields and aren't their recommendation based on this simple fertilizer trials carried out in farmers fields so why isn't it already taking into account the profitability aspect of it as you are saying <coughs> finally the another question i have is that uh, in up <clears throat> in a study that we had carried out at Irade in the eastern UP we found that the smaller farmers were really putting in more fertilizer and getting less yield and part of the problem uh, was that they get this 50 kilo bags and if they had to put 30 kilo or 35 kilo what do they do with the remaining 15 kilos and so on so that that uh, you know indivisibility in the distribution was affecting it Uh, so uh, and i think if you just say that we'll use a generic data as you are saying from the 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 land surveys uh, soil quality map then you are missing out uh, that suppose one farmer had put some more potash or or uh, you know uh, in his land which survives from one crop to the other 
uh, he would really be asked to put more potash further and then his profit would go down. So for an individual farmer to have the generic recommendations uh, would not be very, uh, very sensible to follow. Rajneesh? A couple of uh, general questions. W one is, how good is this advice on the soil card? Is there some independent test that this, it is a credible, is it good that, you know, if people don't follow it, uh, you know, they may be because people uh, haven't found that to be quite useful. So that's one thing. There have been some studies, I think Esther and co-authors have done, on the return to fertilizers, I think. Uh, did anybody do anything? What are the return that these guys are going to get? I think uh, that was a very good comment that you ha you are, these are profit maximizing people. They're not yield maximizers and the two may not coincide. So that, that's another thing. Other thing is, of course, uh, when you ask somebody, I think this, this came up also, um, what would you do rather than what your neighbor does? And uh, those of who, us in the room who are old enough, there is an old business school marketing uh, uh, ex you know, case uh, that used to be done about Edsel. Ford had a car, Edsel, which was a complete failure and was designed by people went going around and saying, what kind of car would you like? Oh, I'd like a very safe car and you know, with everything else. What the question you wanna ask is what would your neighbor like? And your neighbor, you know, he wants fins and he wants this and you, you build a completely different car than if it is up, the question is what you would do or what your neighbor would do. Of course, here it would be in the reverse that you, you want to make sure that uh, the message is what you would do. So uh, those are some comments. Rohini? So I think it's a bit building on the earlier two questions, but let me, <coughs> in keeping with your nonprofit, be more precise about it. It seems like the, the takeaway is that you should not be expanding this, the program right now before you actually know a lot more about these soil health cards. So it seems you particularly don't want to be going around with state governments of India saying that let's use ICT platform for soil health cards because it, there's a lot of reason to believe they shouldn't be taking their health cards up. And if anything, I think, and this goes back to a lot of work that you have done in insurance, you don't want to almost make people first trust an ICT platform and then you know give up on it because the, the data is very poor. So I think that was, mostly what I think I took away a lot from your results. And I think it's, it's very sensible based on exactly this idea that one-off testing, and I think we've seen this in the field as well, of fertilizers doesn't tend to uh, often be very good on it. So Sean? I guess the question, the question is I'm curious to know yeah. how you think about going ahead with other states given that there is yeah. just this very basic concern um, about the data quality. Should we collect a few more? Uh, Why don't we I think we just we have three three more. Okay. Yeah, I think yeah because okay. given the time. So Sh uh, Shanta, do you have your card up? Yeah. No, Devesh. Uh, just uh, one uh, observation and one qu query. So you know, instead of going to the farmers, uh, uh -huh. I had worked with a student of the f getting using ICT to uh, get farmers to come to experts. So what he did was uh, he had an experiment where uh, the farmers would take pictures using cell phones uh, of the plants and the plant health, and he created an AI program where it would automatically diagnose, just like telemedicine, uh, the health of the crop, and where the AI program would not work, that there was a team of agronomists which would sort of convey information back. So it was a more active thing coming from the farmer rather than giving to the farmer. And that creates a very different type of dynamics. Now it was going very well. This was in southern Karnataka, but then th there was a big drought there. And it wiped out any interest of the farmers in this. Which raises to me the question, <coughs> you know, when I think of a lot of these micro studies, yet when we think of the challenges of Indian agriculture, you know, there are these very large macro things of pricing, of MSP, of procurement, and don't they really sweep away all of these interventions, uh, these macro sort of <clears throat> effects? And I'm wondering, relative, 
if you were to put effort in all of these micro ICT, all of that, do you sometimes worry that they can really get swept away by the tsunami of these larger macro forces that really are affecting agriculture in places like India? And I guess the context of that is also Deirish's paper in the last IPF, which actually did deal with precisely those questions. So that's the backdrop, I think, for your question as well. Mihir, do you have? I think this is a restatement of Rohini's question and other people's questions, but I think it would be useful just to be precise about what the ICT is meant to solve. What is the problem it's meant to solve? So I thought the problem it was meant to solve was literacy, which is fantastic, and that makes a ton of sense, which is this audio delivery solves that problem. But if there's all these underlying problems, uh, mismeasurement, the soil testing itself is unreliable, or there's a lot of heterogeneity on advice because people just disagree, then I guess this is just, you know, I guess Rohini's problem, which is that can compound all those issues. So if I had thought naively, which is that testing is reliable and agronomic advice is fairly straightforward. Um, so it would just be useful to know about what the problem is, if it's which problem you're trying to solve. One might be literacy, one might be, for example, economy and delivering expertise. Um, but it all relies on the fundamentals of that process. So th anyway, that's what I was hoping to hear about. Rakesh? Thanks. Um, I, just, I just wanted to uh, take up on a point Mr. Madan raised, uh, which was um, the impact of progressive farmers on their neighbors or friends or others, et cetera. And in a sense, what, from, from, from some work I did long ago, uh, like 45 years ago on the productivity of extension, that from my recollection of the literature, there was a lot of uh, work on, os on, on the osmosis of information, uh, which is very important for the productivity of extension. So in some sense, the question there is that, how can we use ICT methods to improve that osmosis, particularly, say, from progressive farmers to other farmers, because as Mr. Badan said, farmers uh, listen much more to other farmers uh, than experts in the sense they trust other farmers' experiences much more to adopt rather than some expert telling them something. And of course, what's happening is that the progressive farmers have listened to some experts and improved their practices, which then goes off by osmosis. Uh, second point uh, also is, again, uh, from work long ago, that the productivity of extension is the greatest, not among in areas where farmers are relatively progressive, because they do anyway. So you don't have any value added to them. It's also not particularly productive where the farmers are at the other end, because they're just too far down the scale to some extent to make use of information. And, and the productivity of extension is the greatest in the middle category which are neither very far down nor very progressive, so they are much more prone to get the benefit of new information. And again, that's kind of connected to the use of progressive farmers for community workers. So the question in some sense is that how can these kind of uh, findings, if they're correct, be utilized in ICT so that it becomes more, that, that transmission of information among farmers becomes much more efficient? Kartik. Um, yeah, so I think uh, I started out with exactly Mihir and Rohini's question, as you know, and but my read from the paper is that you're almost taking it as given that the government has decided to do this, and then you're seeing how do you then do this better, but not questioning the first place. And that, in some ways, is my main question, which is what I was hoping to ask the chair if uh, Ramesh Chand had shown up, but I'll now also ask the discussants, which is what was the basis that can mean for this massive decision to scale this up? Was there, you know, any IFPRI report, or you know, is there any some CGIR type like process by which at smaller scale evidence and studies were put together to make a recommendation that the government decided to take up or you know just understanding a little bit of the backdrop of how this massive decision to scale up happened without getting the fundamentals right about whether you're even measuring things right right it, uh, that would be very useful uh, let me just add I mean uh, summarize I think what I'm hearing around the room as well as what was going through my own <laughs> mind I mean there the first obvious issue is, you know, going forward, are there going to be actual effects on yields, on profits, and so forth? Uh, uh, and then, depending on what the 
outcomes happen to be, trying to understand the mechanisms. Uh, so I, I presume the first, I think you're going forward, I presume, and uh, going to, but I think the challenging bit is going to be to design the experiment in a way to understand the mechanisms for whatever outcomes result. Because we have had a number of experiments which were very promising at the beginning, and you know, Fafchamp and Minton, or my experiments with price information, Initially, you see an effect on farmers' information and so forth, but then going forward, there's no effect on, on eventual profits. And then I think the, the challenge is to understand why. And you know, there are so many possible reasons, the mismeasurement, the heterogeneity, uh, farmers' processing of information depending on how it's being presented, there's trust, there's social learning, there's risk aversion, and so forth. And you know, with an experiment, you know, no matter how large the scale, there are only so many treatments you can have. So the challenge is to really design it so that you would be able to, to say something. Okay, over to you. Great. Uh, thank you all for those comments. I think I'll, I'll start with Rohinima here and to some sense Tulip's point, which uh, I think is absolutely taken. You know, the, the mission statement of our nonprofit is to design, evaluate, and effective, and if found effective, scale ICT for development. So we've told our funders that if we do a bunch of RCTs and find no effect, we're going to shut down, find something else to do. So that's we're not we're not coming out here with a strong prior that this is this is worthwhile. Uh, it, we, we, that, that that is our prior, but we need evidence before we want to proceed further. I think our conversations with governments are often along the lines of, "You're planning on doing this anyway. Let us see if we can work with you to to make it better or to do, to do a better job. Let's see what we can learn from what 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 you're doing." Uh, for example, uh, in one geography, Erie has done a lot of actually uh, on farmers' fields tests of farmer practices, Erie's new rice model, and agronomic best practices to try to evaluate. In, in, and it's effectively an RCT because they're randomly assigning uh, to plots on the on the farmers' fields to evaluate best practices. They spent ten million dollars in five years doing that, and they've come up with a model. To, to, to recommend uh, rice practices. And so we can then, but they, and they said it, it's great, but there's no way to reach the farmer now with that model because you have to have a laptop or you have to have a smartphone and Arista, nobody has that. And so we say, well, we could help deliver that information to the farmer and design evaluations to see if it really does make the farmer uh, better off. So, so I, 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 I'm, I'm with you there. I think the, you know, we didn't know going into writing this paper whether the soil health cards were going to correlate strongly or not strongly uh, with the uh, on-the-ground tests, but we, we were concerned enough to, to, to do those double checks and not just take the government uh, soil health cards. I think uh, there's a lot of work going on by IFPRI, ERI, CIMIT, and others to do Krieging interpolation, aggregation of results, soil maps, and you know it, it, it may well be that even if you could do an individual level test, that would not be the optimal thing to do. You'd want to, to draw a bunch of draws from a, a distribution and interpolate. So I think that the science will get there. I'm optimistic. And when it gets there, we should know how to disseminate it. But I, I, I would not say that our study shows that exactly the government should switch to ICT to, to deliver soil health cards without first verifying that the soil health cards have information. So I think it's a nuanced message that we're delivering. Uh, and I think we're pretty upfront about it. Um, and then uh, sort of relatively bri briefly on some of the other uh, comments. I think, uh, you know, I mean, part of it comes down to this fundamental, sh should India at all be doing agricultural extension or not, right? You, you might think the farmers are profit maximizing, they're optimal, they're rational, we should just shut down every effort uh, uh, to, to provide agricultural extension. That, that would be a very strong view. Um, uh, I, I think we, our view is that there are, you know, technologies are developing, the green revolution is some, uh, some, some, some evidence that, uh, uh, productivity increase. So, so trying out how to do extension better is probably better than uh, uh, shutting down uh, expansion. I think one promising aspect, if the governments are already going to go out and develop these platforms, I think that can help us learn a lot more about the on the field models. So if, if we can use re remote sensing or automated phone surveys to measure yields, to measure practices, we can build up databases that will give us a much better understanding of the agronomy in the place than the, the just the, the university uh, field. Trials. I think, uh, you know, it sh should should I have instead moved to, you know, I think IFPRI is and other organizations are already doing great work to try to to improve uh, Indian food policy. So it may be that big picture policy changes are more important than these micro things. But I think uh, uh, all have their place uh, in space. Do you, do you have other comments on the? 
So health recommendations. Yes. I'll just add one thing, which is I think what is underlying in a lot of comments is that the production function for farmers is very hard to characterize, and that's obviously true. It's very hard to know, uh, even with these fertilizer recommendations. So first, let me talk about how the fertilizer recommendations are made. So what happens in the context of Gujarat is universities will run field trials, as was al already alluded to, on fields where they just vary the fertilizer application. and they use optimal amounts of all other inputs. And then they say, this is what we find increases yield most. And so as with any RCT, the challenge with this is you're only altering one thing, but you're keeping everything else constant. And they do this over here, so they're able to alter one or two things over time. But the recommendation inherent in the recommendation is the assumption that the farmer is going to be using optimal amounts of all these other inputs, which is obviously not true. That's not what the farmer is going to do. So it's unclear whether these recommendations are going to be optimal for the farmer. And I think Sean already mentioned that one Good thing about ICT is you're able to collect data very quickly from farmers and in a fairly cost-effective way. So perhaps the greatest value of ICT, at least in my novice opinion, is that you might be able to better characterize what the farmer's production function looks like uh, because you know what inputs they have applied and what uh, outcomes they observe. So that might be the greatest sort of. So um, one issue which, sir, you raised, Dr. Parikh, uh, whether the, uh, um, the recommendations are made based on the uh, experiments on the farmer's field. Farmer's field, generally, researchers are not doing experiments. They are on-farm demonstrations, which are being done largely by the state machinery or the Kishi Vigyan Kendras. And they are not using uh, these this data for uh, making the recommendations. but at experiment stations, they are making uh, these recommendations. What I can say you, uh, these, the, again, there are the, what you are asking, the generic recommendation. I'm not saying that generic recommendation for entire state or entire district, but a cluster of, um, for example, in one village, there may be only three or four types of different soils. Or the, 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 so a generic recommendation, and a farmer is specifically growing a new crop or different crop, he can go for his uh, soil test. Uh, this this is my and this will I feel that uh, it should be cost effective, but through soil health card, the one important thing is that we are sensitizing farmers that they should use judiciously use the nutrients. So uh, uh, on another issue, uh, same context which was asked that why this program initiated. You know, this program initiated basically when there were recommendations were coming that they are, we are using excessive use of fertilizer. We are using, especially in Punjab, Haryana, the fertilizer consumption was much, much higher than what was recommended. So if you cut the fertilizer, the productivity may go up. So lots of recommendation came during 90s. If you see the 90s literature, lot of recommendation came then if you cut the fertilizer consumption, especially nitrogen and phosphorus, one productivity will increase and will save huge uh, fertilizer. Uh, this is one issue. Second, uh, the recommendation came that we are uh, mining uh, the micronutrients. M the issue is not important with the macronutrient, but majority in the large country, the micronutrients like you know, uh, zinc, uh, manganese, boron, calcium, uh, they are deficient in soil. For example, Odisha soils, they are deficient in calcium and iron. So you need a different kind of, in you, you need nitrogen, but you also need these things. So they are, we are the, so the plant is mining these nutrients from the soil, which we are not putting. So the soil health card were initially for both macro and micronutrients, but testing micronutrient is very costly. The machine, the equipments are not, you know, you can't take those equipments on the field. So they are very sensitive equipment. So unless we take care of these micronutrients, uh, the macronutrients, I, I am not much worried about micronutrients. This is my perception because since uh, 19, you know, I was a student 1969-70s, the recommendation was 120 kilogram nitrogen, 40 kilogra 80 kilogram phosphorus, 40 kilogram potash. Still same recommendations are coming up from the state agriculture university, same recommendation. And for rain-fed agriculture, 80 kilogram, 40 kilogram, 20 kilogram. So I am not worried about NPK. I am more worried about the micronutrients. I am also worried where there is excessive use of fertilizer. We need to characterize those states, Punjab, Haryana, 
uh, Eastern, Western UP, and some of the commodities where farmers are excessively using fertilizer. Majority of the Indian farmer is using less than the optimum uh, fertilizer. But I, uh, it was mentioned that we should not take the research forward. <coughs> I will suggest that we should take research forward. Research should continue. This is a new area. We need to sensitize farmers. We need to sensitize policy makers also. To use the power of ICT, which is not being effectively used in agriculture sector. And we can come out with good uh, recommendation for the farming community. This is one. The second one was, uh, mm, yeah, there was the advisories. Uh, someone was said the farmers should go to, uh, to the to the uh, to advisory. Uh, you know, there was some time back the uh, DCM Sriram group. They started rural business hubs. It was one stop shop for the farmers in rural area. I was thinking that this is a future of Indian agriculture, especially strengthening the back end, uh, you know, providing services to the farmer, fertilizer, seed. As we go to the mall, everything is available. Where, and for farmers, they have to go to different shops. So the, the, the DCM Siram group started a rural business hubs. Everything was available at one place, including advisories. Advisory. So farmer was taking advisory on soil, on pesticide, and many, many other things, even the insurance and credit. But unfortunately, I don't know why they closed it. They said this was not profitable. But we need these kinds of initiatives. Therefore, I said that the role of private sector is very important. Uh, through the public sector, we have initiated a flagship program. Now, I think they need that uh, the private sector take it over, forward, de develop different models so that the farmers uh, should be benefited, one, on using eff effective use of fertilizer, and also save huge quantities of fertilizer in the country. Well, actually, this is the first time I've come to the IPF, and you know, I don't. I know you don't need a certificate, but really, to me, how I look at a forum is the kind of questions that get asked, and I think some wonderful questions were asked. And let me try and quickly address them. Uh, Devish, the point you raised, uh, the macros are what is impacting Indian agriculture at the moment. I don't think I've seen this kind of a hopelessness in a long, long time in agriculture. And the problem is not underproduction, it is overproduction. And not being able to, therefore for the farmer, very clearly, a 10% drop in production could be a 40% increase in price. But a 5% increase in production could be a 50% drop in price. And it just doesn't make sense. And therefore, you have to start looking at these macros and that whole area of an MSP, which doesn't seem to work in practice, uh, but gives wrong signals at points of time. And then people don't really act up on their, the promise they have made. The gap between what the farmer is paying and the consumer is continuing to increase uh, at the end of the day, and that's also impacting these guys. Uh, it's really been bad. You know, from just before demonetization, I noticed it, and it's only got worse uh, going forward. At this point of time, we are at speak, and what we saw uh, probably, uh, and the fact I was surprised that it came so late. Uh, and I'm also surprised that it has actually kind of got quietened down by what has happened today, what has happened just with a couple of farm waivers, because they are not solutions. So I think the macros are what we need to address, and overproduction is what we need to address. I think the farmers are getting, uh, are at this point of time, are in a, in a much weaker situation because they are producing more, like any other economic commercial. Uh, so that's really uh, point number one. Point number two on uh, progressive farmers, as you said, uh, 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 Dr. Mohan, key. Our own people, we come, we, are, we have doctors, we have all these intelligent guys who kind of come and they think they know what to do with agriculture. But they are not even half as good when it comes to these progressive farmers because these progressive farmers do it themselves. So uh, it's been a lot of retraining to people to say, first of all, go to progressive farmers, understand what he's doing, and if you can actually match him, then I'll say you're a good farmer. We also have our own demo farms and model farms, and their benchmark is not average yields. That's the yield of the progressive farmer and what he's doing and so on and so forth. So how do we leverage that? Do we have, uh, first of all, it needs to be localized. There's no point having a progressive farmer in Gujarat advising somebody in Bihar, you know, and one. But if you can, you know, actually localize it, audio, video recordings of what he's doing, starting from the fact that he does a soil analysis and so on and so forth. And th those, I think, would help. How do we encourage them to actually participate in imparting knowledge uh, is something we need to figure out. Do we put an advertising uh, revenue model where you have ads in between your uh, audio jingles or whatever? I will leave it to all of you to figure out. But I think there is, those are the guys whom we need to harness. Our university professors, our um, uh, people in the government, etc., also come with the same baggage which my guys come with. You know, how can this guy know more than me? Many of them. There will be a few who won't, but I think that baggage is a very difficult one to remove. But the farmers, if that 21% number actually have proven that they give it some merit. Lastly, on the soil health card, just a very brief comment. These soil health cards are generated by universities 
or by fertilizer companies and literally it's a free uh, it's free literally the fertilizer companies do it free for the for their own farmers the universities do it free for the government anything which is given free who the hell cares about the quality at the end of the day you know there's no accountability so that one percent which the government put in I and mean, we need to have an audit for anything free but if you can actually and unfortunately farmers won't pay for it but I think that's one reason why the quality of this particular health card by themselves are not as good as they would be otherwise. Thank you. Any, uh, I, I wanted to get back to the, the profitability question because I think uh, you know, the point estimates at significant at the 10% level suggest an increase in profitability, but it's not a slam dunk. I think a challenge in settings like this is uh, you know, this is not you know, information. There are lots of uh, examples of failed informational interventions or things that go away after time. I think one problem is just the, the, the impact may be relatively small. And so the, the impact may be there, but you need a very large study, maybe over a very large number of years to actually discern it. That's, uh, fr from my perspective, that's okay because the cost of offering this is so low, right? It's you know three rupees per year to complement the soil health card with, with these audio messages that if the benefit is only 10 rupees of expected profit increase, well, that's a three to one uh, benefit cost ratio uh, and, and, and that may, may come off you know the as a Well, you need, you need sufficiently large sample. Yeah, and, and so that's the point, that there's so much uncertainty there in the mind of the, of the farmer. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's right. Totally agreed. Uh, I, and, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 guess, I guess the question is to say, do we just say it's impossible to improve agricultural productivity, or, or do we say Erie has spent, you know, $10 million over the past five years in cooperation with the Gates Foundation to try to come up with better rice models and new new rice varieties, et cetera, et cetera, and they seem to be doing well. And should we then try those in the field, do an RCT, and find out if, if they work? And if they work, then we should scale that up. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm not willing, willing to give up. Uh, I think, pro you know, connecting with progressive farmers is, is a great idea. I think, you know, you, we, we are have piloting sort of experience sharing in our platform where local farmers can talk about their experiences and share those by audio with other farmers and that may be more convincing than the agronomist. Uh, we're also, uh, the, the platform can be used to promote crop diversification. So it may be that people are very good at planting crops that they've been planting for 10 years, but there's too much supply of wheat or too much supply of something else and they should be growing vegetables or cumin or something like that. And so the platform can introduce them to these new new things that they might not thought of them and walk, walk them through uh, uh, how to do it. And uh, they, it, you know, it's like a manual for somebody who's illiterate. Uh, and then the final thing that I think is uh, compelling about ICT uh, platforms is that it can be demand driven. So w uh, because you get hundreds or thousands of questions a day, you know exactly what the farmers want to know. And you can then research or, or try to come up with your best answer to those questions and give those answers back, not just to those farmers, but to other farmers who may be struggling with the same issues and not knowing it. And so that's very different than an academic sitting at a university thinking, these are the 10 things that people need to do to, to maximize profits. And I'm just gonna spread that out over the whole state. Any comments on the macro issue that Devesh raised? I, look, I, I'm all for more rational uh, pricing of fertilizer and uh, reform of um, uh, minimum support prices and, and many other issues. And uh, it's just not my uh, comparative competence uh, to work on that. Thank but you, I, I think there's, you know, there's some value to having a seat at the table uh, also. And so I, I'm, I'm hoping that by showing the government that there are easy ways to, to, to improve what they're doing, we can, we can increase the focus on evidence-based policy. It's one comment. Okay. I mean, Garima said that, you know, the farmers' fertilizer trials are carried out. Uh, assuming where only the fertilizer is varied, but the other things are supposed to be optimal. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, T.N. Srinivas and myself and Bhagit Minas, we did some analysis of simple fertilizer trials in the early 70s. And we found that uh, our understanding then was the only fertilizer doses are varied. The other inputs and practices were the farmer's practices. And there was no yeah. understanding of optimization there. Uh, uh, and aside is that after, and our recommendations were very different than the recommendations that, that the agronomists were making. And, the, uh, and aside is that five years later, when I asked for more fertilizer trials data, uh, an agronomist from the IERI recommended to the I ministry that since Professor Parikh and Srinivasan are misusing this data, they should not be given this data. <laughs> and and, and that, that is generally a constraint right now that you, the, 
agricultural universities, as I understand, have kind of a monopoly on making agricultural uh, advice. And so Erie, in Odisha, actually had the, worked with the universities kind of to cooperate to get them to, to validate the model. But for sure, there are, there are, like I said yesterday, sometimes it's frustrating. There, there are many constraints in every direction. Okay, with that, thank you very much, uh, Sean, Garima, and uh, Mr. Joshi, Mr. Madan, and everybody. A very stimulating exchange. We will reconvene at 11.30, back on track. <laughs> <laughs>